shout a praise to the Lord for what he's already done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. I love him. Oh, I love him. <laughs> they brought my laptop a Bible. I'm like, I'm a real, uh, I, I could have carried that. Um, no, but I love him. I love him so much. And listen, the thing that I love, Alicia, but the thing that I love about being in a room full of women is that, like, we know how to pour it out on the Lord. We know how to pour it out on the Lord. Um, and so there's just been so much sweet worship tonight. Welcome to Vibe Night. Welcome to Vibe Night. This is our first gathering of the year, and I am so excited to have you tonight. My name is Erica. It is my honor to serve the women of this house. Um, tonight, I, we want to honor a very special lady in the room, our first lady. Can you clap for our first lady, Pastor Missy? Pastor Missy is back, y'all. She's back. Um, and so we're so grateful um, to God for our first lady and... You know, I, I take it very seriously, the assignment to cover our pastors. I take that very seriously. And there, there are a lot of times where pastors will pour and pour and pour and never get anything back. So I take it, I pray for them every day, every day. Um, and I encourage you to pray for your pastors. Let's thank God for our pastors. Yeah, we're blessed, we're blessed. Well, you can take your seat. Go ahead and sit down. Did you enjoy the worship? Yeah. Well, tonight, ladies, um, see, this is going to be into, okay, can y'all just look around the room? Just look around. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Um, well, tonight, you know, we're just going to talk because we're all girls in here. We're just going to talk. Can we just talk? Like, I'm not going to, like, you, you might not run and jump tonight, you know. Um, Pastor Jeremy, he's the preacher. I, I'm, I'm a teacher, so I like to take my time and teach the word of God. So um, I might not make you run and jump tonight, but you're going to learn something. Are you ready? All right. Y'all ready for the word? Okay, let's get into it. Um, tonight, I want to talk to you about your calling. I want to talk to you about your calling I sincerely believe tonight that tonight is a night of preparation. I believe that God is preparing many of us in this room to, for a shift. I got to mention this because it's going to bother me all night long. Y'all see the bottom of these flowers? How they're not like, they're, they're not supposed to be up here. I just had to get that out, okay? I just had to get that out because if it would... I'm telling you, I would be up here preaching, and it would bother me all night long. Okay, we got that out the way. Um, <laughs> no, I believe that God is preparing many of us in this room for a shift. And I always know what kind of season that people are in by the kind of word that God will have me to release. And when I was praying and asking God what, what word he wanted me to share, I didn't get a word of rebuke. I didn't get a word of correction. I got a word of preparation. And I believe that many of us are in a season of change. Now, change isn't always easy. But I believe that we're in a season of change. So, so for some of you, you are dissatisfied. You know, like life is not miserable. You're not unhappy, you know. You're not sad or anything. It's just like, huh, is there anything more? Like, I know it's got to be more than this. It's got to be more to it than, you know, anybody been just a little dissatisfied, right? I call it holy discomfort, you know? It's like life is not terrible. Ain't nobody sick. We all right, but it's got to be more to it. I call it a holy discomfort. And, you know, back in Bible times, when God wanted to move his people from one place to, the no to another, he would dry up the water supply. He would dry up the well to get them uncomfortable enough to move. It's a holy discomfort because God knows that sometimes you're not going to move until you get uncomfortable. 
And so there are some of us in this room, and you, you are, you're doing a great job on your job. You got, you know, you got stuff going for you, but there's more. And I'm here to prepare. I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like a chaperone tonight. I'm here to escort you into your calling. Is that all right? Now, <clears throat> one of the biggest lies that the enemy sells to us, especially women, is that we have time. You got time. Wait, wait until, wait until you get married. Then pursue your call. Wait until after the kids are out of the house. Wait until, you know, you get that promotion and then it's a lie. You don't have time. I don't care if you're 21 years old. Your calling can't wait. And the enemy wants you to believe that the call that God has placed on your life can wait. Can't wait. Jesus, in John chapter number 9, John chapter number 9, Jesus heals a blind man, and his disciples ask him why, and this was his response. John 9, verse number 4, Jesus says, we must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. If Jesus was in a hurry, your calling can't wait. You have an assignment and a call on your life, and I'm here to tell you tonight, if you are spending your life on anything else, you are wasting time. I came with guns blazing tonight, and I feel a little like, y'all are like, okay, does she like us? I love you. I love you. Ooh, big hug uh, for all y'all. I love you. But I'm telling you, there are so many callings and purpose, purposes in this room that are lying dormant because you think you got time. You don't have time. I mu Jesus said this. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me because when night comes, no man can work. It's still daytime for us. And there's something that God has called us to do. In order to move. In order to move your life in the direction of your calling, it is going to necessitate that you develop laser focus. Somebody say laser focus. In order for you to move into the calling that God has placed on your life, it is going to necessitate that you develop right now laser focus. See, if I'm focused right here, I don't care what's going on over here, right? In order for me to move in my calling, I'm going to have to develop laser focus. And this is why. Because focus kills distractions. Focus kills distractions. If I know where my destination is and I've got focus on my calling, it kills distractions. If I know that I'm called to be a wife, I'm not wasting my time with a man that just wants a girlfriend. If I know that I'm called to politics, I'm not wasting my time in medical school, right? Because focus kills distractions. But see, if focus kills distractions, then let's take this a step further. Then distractions kill callings. Distractions kill callings. How many of us have been spending our lives feeling like we're moving and making no progress. Distractions kill callings. And sometimes we're tempted to tolerate distractions because they're good distractions, right? They're good distractions. Like, like you have a calling for ministry, but you say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do social work right now. And social work is it's good, right? It's a good distraction, and the enemy will make you think, go ahead and focus on social work. It's good. Now, social, ain't no one wrong with, nothing, nothing's wrong with social work. It's nice, right? Who wouldn't want to be the person that, like, knocks on Miss Jones' door and makes sure she's taking her medicine? I don't know. I don't know what social, pe social worker, workers do. But, um, like, it's nice, right? Here's the problem. When you get to the end of your life, and you're standing before the Lord. 
he's not going to reward you for being nice. He's going to reward you for being obedient. And every good thing, see, social work is good, ain't nothing wrong. But if that's not your calling, but it's good, every good thing is not a God thing. And that's why we must develop laser focus. Let me give you an example. It's like, let's say I am, is this all right? We're just talking. We're friends, right? Let me give you an example. It's like if I'm, I'm hired at Chick-fil-A, right? I'm hired at Chick-fil-A. And the next day, I show up to Wendy's, okay? I show up to Wendy's, and I am, Jazz, I am working my tail off at Wendy's. I mean, I am the best doggone Chick-fil-A worker that Wendy's ever had, right? <laughs> And you know Chick-fil-A trains people well, so I'm at Wendy's saying, how may I help you today? And yes, ma'am, it's my pleasure to serve you. And the other Wendy's workers are like, what? What do you want? <laughs> what, you want the number two? You know, like you just, I stick out like a sore thumb because I'm like, I am, I'm coming in early, I'm staying late, I'm doing other people's job. I am, I got hired at Chick-fil-A, but I am at Wendy's working my tail off. So I do that for six days straight. And then I show up to the boss and then I'm like, I'm, I'm looking for my check, and the boss is like, I'm sorry, what's your name again? I'm like, Erica, the star worker. What are you talking about? And he's like, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have a payment for you. Because yes, you worked your tail off, you showed up, but you showed up to the wrong job. That's how it's going to feel when we get to the end of our lives, and we walk up to the pearly gate is it pearly gates or is that just a myth <laughs> I don't know and we walk up to the pearly gates right and we're standing before the Lord and you got your hand out for a reward and he's gonna look at you and he's gonna say I don't you, you're gonna say now God I worked my tail off as a missionary in Africa and he's gonna say but I but I called you to be in the medical field in the hospital down the street from your house and you're going to come to him for a reward, and he's going to say, I'm sorry, I don't have anything for you because I can't pay you for an assignment that I didn't hire you for. <laughs> Somebody say laser focus. God is extending an invitation to us tonight to pursue calling. He's extending an invitation to pursue calling. Now notice, I'm using the word pursue because a lot of us just want the calling to drop in our lap. And we don't want to do any work. And we're looking like, well, I don't know. I'm not good at nothing. I don't know. You have to pursue calling. When you pursue something, you don't wait for it. Remember how you pursued that guy in high school? <laughs> okay, let me, let me stay focused. Somebody say laser focus. Yes. Let me stay focused. Now, there are people who say they don't have a purpose. You know, I was there once. I'm like, I don't, I'm not, what am I, what am I here to do? Like, you know, I'm hanging out in life. I'm getting married, having kids. Like, but what, like, what is this all about? What is my purpose? Have you ever asked that question? Like, what is, what, what am I here? Like, this is cool, but what am I here for? Right? And there are people who would say, I don't have a purpose or a calling, but I want you to know, even if you haven't figured it out yet, that's not true. You were born with a calling. Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter number one. Jeremiah one and four says, God says to Jeremiah, he says, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, wait a minute now. We got to go through this. So before you were formed, you had an assignment. Because this is not just God talking to Jeremiah. This is God talking to his people. He says, before I formed you, before you were a zygote, before you were an embryo, Right? Yeah? Okay. I'm not a science person. Before you were a fetus, you had a calling. You had a purpose. And what he says to Jeremiah 
is before I formed you in the womb, I called you and I sanctified you. Now, when you sanctify something, that means to set it apart for a special purpose, right? It's like if, I, if I'm, I'm, I'm planning Thanksgiving and I got all my dishes out, right? But I got that one dish from my grandma, and it's special. So I choose that, I set that dish apart, and I say, I'm going to use this for something special. That's what it means to when God sanctifies you, he chooses you out and he sets you apart for something special. God is saying before I even, before your mom and daddy got together, I ordained you for a specific purpose. You would not be here without a calling. It's like me going to jeans and saying, um, here I am. And she's like, I didn't, I didn't call you. You wouldn't be here if you weren't called. You would not. If you're here, it's because you have a calling. God has a specific purpose that is on your life. Before you had a body, you had a purpose. And the only reason you have a body is because you have a purpose. So I want to prepare you tonight to respond to the call. Y'all ready for this? Yeah? Um, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter number 19. And let's stand for the reading of God's word. 1 Kings chapter number 19. And we're going to read 19 through 21. You know, I was always curious about we stand, why we stand up when we read the scripture. You know, anybody else been curious about that? And then one day I was reading the Bible and I read a scripture that says Jesus came into the temple. He took the scroll, read from it, and then he closed the scroll and then he went back and sat down. And I was like... That means Jesus stood up for the word. If Jesus can stand up for the word, we can stand up for the word, right? Okay. Now, 1 Kings chapter number 19 and verse 19. It says, so Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing in a field. What was he doing? Plowing in a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in a field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First, let me go and kiss my mother and father goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, Go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then he, then he went with Elijah as his assistant. There are some things tonight that we can learn about calling from the calling that was on Elisha. And we're going to take our text tonight from verse number 21. It says, so Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. I want to use tonight for a topic, kill the ox and burn the plow. Kill the ox and burn the plow. Yes, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to surround ourselves around your word. Your word declares that the entrance of your word gives life and light. It illuminates our understanding. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would illuminate our understanding tonight. Nobody in here came to hear Erica. This is your word. This is your sermon. These are your children. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. And we credit, we covenant to give you and you alone all glory, honor, and praise for everything that is revealed tonight. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. 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 You may have your seat. Now, the first thing we notice, this is a familiar passage of story. The Bible says that the old prophet Elijah comes to the young prophet Elisha. Now, those names sound really similar, so I'm going to need you to kind of focus in and kind of pay attention to the difference. So the old prophet Elijah comes to the young prophet Elisha, he throws his cloak over him, 
right? And Elisha knew exactly what that meant. He throws his cloak over him and he calls him into ministry. Now, the first thing we, t we need to notice is that when God calls Elisha, he's not in the school of the prophets. When God calls Elisha, he's not in the temple preparing a sacrifice. When God calls Elisha, he's not like hanging out with the other prophets. When God calls Elisha, he is running a business. Because the Bible says in verse number 19, it says, So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing in a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12 team. Now, if you're like me, when I read a scripture like that, and it says it was 12 teams of oxen in the field and blah, 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 I'm thinking, okay, why do I need that much detail? You know? Like, I get it. He was in the field, but 12 teams of oxen. So, like, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, what are you, what are you trying to say? Because the Bible says that all scripture is profitable. None of it can be wasted. You can't throw any of it away and say, okay, that was extra. Um, let me focus here. No, all scripture is profitable. So I'm at, we have to ask ourselves, why would God give us that much detail? The Bible wants you to know that when God found Elisha, he was the man. He didn't have 12 oxen. The Bible says he had 12 teams of oxen. That means he had like a whole bunch of money. He was running a business right? So he wasn't hurting for, for something to do. It's not like when God came to Elisha, he was like, yes, now I finally have something to do with my life. No, when God found Elisha, he was in a field plowing with the 12th team. The Bible is trying to let you know he was already doing something. And God comes to Elisha and calls him out of his field and into his calling. I want to let you know tonight that there are some of you that God is going to call out of your field. He's going to call some of us out of our field and into our calling. Here's what I need you to know. For many of us, God is calling you into a space that you aren't familiar with. And in the natural, you don't fit the description. See, like Elisha, he didn't fit the description of a prophet. Like, God, why didn't God just go to one of, the, one of the guys that were already prophets, right? Why did he tell Elijah to go all the way to Damascus and find this random dude and anoint him to be the next prophet of Israel? Now, you got to realize this was not a small assignment. See, this is back in Bible times when the nation wasn't led by, like, government, governmental leaders. They were led by the prophets. The prophets were the voices of God. And so God tells Elijah, he's like, you're getting older. I need you to go to Damascus, find this random guy in a field, and then call him into ministry. Why did he choose Elisha? I'm here to let you know that even though Elisha did not fit the description, when God's hand is on you, his hand will find you. And for many of us, you're not going to fit the description for what God's about to do in your life. And God will snatch you from the background. He will bypass all the folks that's qualified. And he will place his hand on you. And I don't care who's doing, who's already doing it, who already has a following, who's, already, who's, who's a prophet already, who's a singer already. God will find you when his hand is on you. Because when you have a calling, I don't care where you are, he's going to find you and he's going to place you where he wants you to be. I've got a prophetic word that I need to release tonight. God is about to put you in spaces and rooms that you don't qualify to be in. Now I'm going to let that marinate. See, because what happens, what happens, Cynthia got her hand up. What happens is usually when we hear a prophetic word, we, it goes in one ear and out the other. You just let it pass you on by. And I'm here to tell you that you have to take a prophetic word, right? So I'm going to try that again. God is about to put you in spaces and rooms that you don't qualify to be in. See, because prophecy is just like a calling. 
The calling isn't optional, but your response is. Prophecy is going to go forth, but if you don't receive it, it won't affect your life. But I have a prophetic word tonight. And this isn't like some word that I got off Google, right? I've been laboring. I've been laboring over this. And the Lord says to speak this over you tonight. God is about to put you in spaces and rooms that you don't qualify to be in. And he's about to give you access to people that other people have been trying to get to for years. Receive that tonight. Now, I'm telling you, there will be some of us who will hear this word tonight and be like, oh, okay, that was great, and it'll pass you by, but you've got to take it. I, I, w- I was on my phone the other day, and I was looking at a, um, a, woman of, a woman of God that I greatly admire. So I'm on her page, and I'm looking at her video, and the Lord says to me, he says, Erica, you're going to be in the same room with, her, room with her in the next six months. And y'all know what I did? I was like, yeah, right. I'm looking, at, I'm looking at the phone, and I'm looking up like, no, I'm not. Y'all, I promise you, I felt the spirit of God say, okay, never mind. And I was like, wait, 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 hold, hold. <laughs> before, you, before you go, I receive that word, right? Because it's your responsibility to take the word. Now, when you get a prophetic word, like if I told you, you can get a million dollars. Thus saith the Lord. You're going to get a million dollars tomorrow, right? If I say that to you, now y'all receive it. Okay. I see how it is. Um, if I tell you you're going to get a million dollars tomorrow, your next logical question would be how? That sounds good, right? I want a million dollars. I wouldn't say no. But my question is, Okay, how? In the words of Kanye West, how, Sway? (laughs) How? And let me tell you why how is not a bad question. It's not a bad question. Let me tell you who else asked how. Mary, the mother of Jesus. The angel comes to her and he says, thus saith the Lord, you are highly favored among women and you shall bring forth the son of God and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Y'all know the Christmas play uh, verses, right? And, and you're favored and you're going to bring forth the son of God. Mary, her first question wasn't like, okay, when? Her first question wasn't like, um, okay, like what do I do next? Her first question was, how, Gabriel? I don't know if it was Gabriel. But she was like, how? Right? Luke. Luke chapter number one, verse number 34. Luke 1, 34, Mary asked the angel, but how can this be? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit. Now, he could have stopped right there. He could have stopped right there and end of discussion. Because there are some, of, some people, what some people have to work their entire lives for, you're going to walk into because of the Holy Spirit. So he says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And what was once impossible, because of the Holy Spirit, because of the Spirit of grace, the Bible calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of grace and truth. What was once impossible because of grace now becomes possible to you. And isn't it interesting that when the angel comes to Mary, the first thing she does is tell him why she's, she's not qualified. Don't we do that? If God says, I'm calling you to do this, I'm calling you to do that. Not me? You sure you're not talking about? Immediately we talk about why, the reasons why we don't qualify. But I'm here to tell you that when you got the Holy Ghost, When you have grace, you don't need talent. When you have grace, you don't need a great resume. When you have grace, you don't need a bunch of references. Because what's impossible for somebody else because of grace, it's possible for you. Now, let me talk to you about grace. See, grace is divine enablement. It's divine. 
When something is divine, that means like it comes from above. Grace is divine enablement. And it's divine enablement that is not dependent upon your ability. Oh, you missed that. I said grace is divine enablement that does not depend on your ability. Let me tell you why. Because the Bible says that when the angel came to Mary, she, he said, you're going to have this baby. And she said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm a teenager. I'm a virgin. I, got, I mean, I got a man, but he ain't going to be my man after he hear this, right? <laughs> and she's telling him all the reasons why, like, I don't, I don't think you got the right girl. And this is what, now, she asked him why. And why, I mean, how, and how is an okay question, because if it wasn't a good question, the angel, after he prophesied to her, he would have just, zoop. That's what angels do, right? <laughs> I don't know. Zoop. After he gives the prophecy, he would have just went on about his business, went and, had, went and had lunch with Michael and Raphael. What are the other angels? No, those, those are the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Wait, hold up. Sorry. What's another angel? Come on, Jeans. I know you know. Okay. Michael. Ruff, all right. That, that's not what this lesson is about. Hey, guys. Laser focus. Okay? Laser focus. She asked him how, and it was an okay, okay question because he responded. See, there were times in scripture when Jesus would say something to somebody and they would ask him a question. And he would just turn, turn and go on about his business. Like, don't ask me that. The angel actually responds because he wants to tell her how. Here's the thing. With grace, divine enablement that is not dependent upon your ability, he wanted Mary to realize that God didn't, a need, didn't need her ability. He needed her yes. Because grace will automatically attach itself to a yes in the earth. He didn't need her ability. See, because God says to her when she says, I'm a virgin, how am I going to do that? He says, you know what, Mary, don't even worry about the seed. I got the seed. I just need your womb. Are you willing to let your life become a womb? Let's go back to Elisha. Is this helping anybody so far? Let's go back to Elisha. Now. Let me teach you how to pursue your calling. Elisha, Elijah, the older prophet, he comes to a businessman, throws his cloak over him. And I told you, Elisha knew exactly what that meant. He was like, oh, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, like, I know exactly what this means. Elijah throws his cloak over Elisha and calls him into ministry. Now, what Elisha does next is crazy. The Bible says... That Elisha, when the cloak is thrown over him, he looks, now he was in the field plowing, right? The Bible says that he looks at the ox and he looks at the plow. He kills the ox and he burns the plow. That was crazy. He didn't have any history with being a prophet. So what Elisha does basically is he kills his plan B. He kills his crutch. Like, the Bible didn't say that Elisha, like, took the plow and the ox and, like, put them in storage just in case this prophecy thing don't work out. <laughs> the Bible didn't say that he took the ox and the plow and he asked his brother, hey, hold this for me because I might be back. No, the Bible says that he kills the ox and he burns the plow because Elijah understood that if I'm going to pursue this, ain't going to be no going back. He understood that his calling was going to cost him his past. Look at somebody next to you and say, your calling is going to cost you something. In order to pursue your calling, you have to completely abandon your past. You can't put your past in storage. You can't have your cousin on the next street over. Hold it. You are going to have to completely abandon abandon your past. If you're going to step into the new season, you're going to have to destroy everything that reminds you of your past. If God is calling you to start a business, you can't keep 
answering phones for your uncle. Oh, I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. If God has called you to pursue something, you've got to kill the crutch. Because in order for you to pursue calling, it's going to necessitate that you have. Now, let's go back to the scripture. This is fun. Let's go back to the scripture. Uh, 1 Kings 19, 19 through 21. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there ran after Elijah and said to him, first, let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, do what you got to do, right? He didn't say that, but that's basically what he meant. Okay, I'm just saying. Verse number 21. So Elisha returned to his, returned to his family, returned to his mom to say goodbye. Elijah returned to his what? Elijah returned to his oxen and slaughtered it. Elisha, Elisha contemplates going back to say, Mama, I won't be back. He contemplates going home. He goes back, but instead of going back to his mama, he goes back to the oxen and he kills it. Let me tell you. He understood that if he went back to what was familiar, it was going to do nothing but remind him of who he used to be. And some of us can't move on in our calling because we keep going back. Back to what? Back to that old boyfriend. I'm sorry, let me say that slower. Back to that old boyfriend. Uh-huh. Watch your toes, ladies. Watch your toes. I'm talking about the one that you don't even like. You just call him when you're hungry. Yeah, this is women's ministry. Mm -hmm. You don't like nothing about him. You can't stand the way he chews. You hate his shoes. Let me find another rhyme. You feel used? No. <laughs> no. You don't even like this dude. But you're down to your last $30, and you're like, what's for dinner tonight? Let me see what Tyrone is doing, <laughs> right? Hey, I was single before. I know how this goes. I know how this goes. Some of us can't move into our calling because we keep going back. Back to old habits. Back to old addictions. Back to that old depression. Back to that low self-esteem. And let me tell you, see, some of us keep going back to low self-esteem because it's comfortable. Low self-esteem is like a warm, snuggy blanket. You wrap yourself in it, and when I'm wrapped in low self-esteem, I don't have to try. If I, no, I have low self-esteem. I can't do that. And you go back. When God is calling you out, you get uncomfortable, and you go back to what's familiar. You wrap yourself in, in, in low self-esteem because you know if I put this on, if I put this cloak on, I don't have to try hard. What do you keep going back to? I'm here to tell you that if you're going to pursue calling, you're going to have to get rid of everything that reminds you of who you used to be. Some of us are... Some of us are going to have to give back the engagement ring. Yeah. And, so, and I, I heard you. You're thinking, he, he was too broke to buy it. That's my ring. I bought that ring. I'm telling you, give it back. Some of us are going to have to delete the number. Like, just delete it. I, and I delete it. Don't put it in your phone as like a warning emoji. No. <laughs> delete the number. Some of us are going to have to walk away from some things. You're going to have to get rid of everything that reminds you of who you used to be. This is why the devil knows 
that the best way to keep you stuck in old patterns in life is to make you think that you can move on without letting go. I remember when I was, I was, in, um, I was in college, and Pastor Missy, I had my first love in college, right? And I am like, I'm in love, love. Like, the, the stage just beyond lo- uh, borderline obsession. But I'm in, I'm in love, right? So I'm in love with this guy, and he cheats on me and breaks my heart. So I'm crushed. Now, y'all know all the cliches and movies of people who are like, bro- like, <laughs> like, I was, I was a hot mess, okay? Like, I stopped going to class. I have no idea if I passed that semester. I don't, e- I don't know what happened. I was just, I was, I was as destroyed as a 19-year-old can be. I was just hurt, right? And I remember going to God one day, and I'm like, God, please, like, can you help me out? I just want to be over him. And I heard the Lord say this. He said, Erica, you're not over it because it's not over. And I'm thinking, what? He cheated. Like, I'm sad, but I ain't crazy. Like, it's over, (laughs) you know? And the Lord said, no, no, no. It's not over until you let go. Mm. So then the Holy Spirit says to me, I can prove to you that you haven't let go. There's a bunch of stuff in your house that belong to him. There's a bunch. So what I, let me tell you all what I did. I went through everything. I ransacked the place. Every card, every no, This is back when people wrote, still wrote notes. Every note, every, every, if I felt like he sat on a blanket, I threw it away. Like I, everything, it was like a sale. Everything must go. It's got to go, right? And so I remember like he brought some family pictures to my house and like he loved his grandma and you know, he was showing me his family pictures and he was really, these pictures were, were special to him. I threw his grandma away. I was like, nope, uh-uh. I didn't even call him to come get that stuff. I threw it away and let me tell you what happened. The minute I got rid of the stuff, I was over it. Because you're gonna have to get rid of everything that reminds you of who you used to be. Because some stuff carries spirits. That's not what I'm here to talk about tonight. Moving on. You can't move on without letting go. And if you're gonna pursue calling, you're gonna have to let go. For some of us, it's that job. For some of us, it's, you know, it's that group of friends. Like if God has delivered you from gossip, you can't keep talking to Susan. If your name is Susan, I'm, I'm sorry, no disrespect. You can't keep going back. If God has delivered you from, um, from addiction, you can't keep hanging out with people who do the things that you used to do, right? If God has delivered you from homosexuality, you can't keep, oh, y'all think homosexuality just affects the men, right? Mm. See, this is women's ministry. I don't know what y'all came here for tonight. This is women's ministry, right? I didn't come here to drink a cup of coffee and talk about Ruth. I came to see some people set free tonight. We're going to talk about some stuff tonight. And I don't want you to be so naive to think that that's not in this room. Because the devil don't play fair. And what he's, see, his goal is to prohibit godly seed from coming into the earth. That's his goal. But his, the way he maneuvers that goal is to make you think you can't trust a man. You'd be better off with Susan. Okay, back, back to, back. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm here to tell you tonight, you're going to get set free. They, sometimes, sometimes we come in here and we talk about the pretty sins. We talk about the cute stuff. Because when I said gossip, y'all was like, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> but the enemy... Is after your sexuality. 
I know what I'm talking about. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Don't even worry about it. You're going to get set free tonight. Don't even worry about it. Now, can we go deeper? The reason why most people don't fulfill the assignment God has placed on their life is because oftentimes their condition contradicts their calling. And the enemy will trick you into thinking that because you're, you're like, who, me? He'll make you think that you're not the, in your condition will contradict your calling. It's like when God came to Elisha, Elisha wasn't in the condition to be a prophet. When he found him, he found him in a field. And so what the enemy does is when your condition contradicts your calling, he'll make you think that you don't qualify because your condition contradicts your calling. It's not true. Usually when God calls us, we don't fit the description. You don't fit the description. For what God's about to do, you don't fit the description. And we're forced to make sense of the contradiction between where we are and who we are. See, because Elisha had to contend with, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm in a field. He had to contend with the contradiction between where he was and who he was. If you're going to walk in your calling, you're going to have to overcome the contradiction between where you are and who you are. Because I told you that before God formed you in the womb, he called you something. And your condition may not make sense to you. Your condition may not validate the calling. But you're, if you're going to pursue purpose, you're going to ha have to overcome the contradiction between where you are and who you are. Somebody say, where I am is not who I am. Your calling often won't make sense in the natural. Because your natural condition will never validate a supernatural reality. And you got to listen, if your calling makes sense, it ain't from God. It's not. Because God never, like, if you tell me your calling and I say, oh, okay, I can see that. I can promise you it's not divine. Because what often what God calls us contradicts who we are and where we are. God comes to Elisha. He looks at a businessman but sees a prophet. God comes to Mary. He looks at a teenager but sees the mother of a savior. God comes to David. He looks at a runt but sees a giant killer. Your calling will often contradict your circumstance. Now, if I told you my calling, you'd be like, <laughs> okay. Like, it, it wouldn't make I wouldn't even waste my time because it sounds ridiculous, right? You probably, you know how you tell somebody something that they don't believe and they're a little patronizing. They're like, oh, that's nice. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that happens. That's awesome. They don't believe you. If I told you my calling, you wouldn't believe it. It's because my current condition contradicts the calling that God has placed on my life. But I'm here to tell you that if it doesn't make you blush, if it doesn't cause some people to doubt it, if it doesn't cause some people to be like, mm, oh, that's nice. It's not from God because God's not even comfortable unless he's doing the exceeding abundantly above. He's not going to do nothing small. So if you come to me with a little, a little piece of calling, I'm going to tell you to go back to the throne because you didn't get that from him. Often what God will call us to do will be ridiculous in the natural, but our natural condition will never validate our supernatural reality. All right. I'm wrapping up. Listen, I have four keys, four keys to help you to walk into your calling. You ready? Okay, number one. The first is you must let go. Somebody say let go. let go. Moving on means letting go. And we all have something 
that we need to let go of. It could be old habits. It could be procrastination. It could be self-doubt. It could be grief. Do you know that you can, you can, you can be free from grief? See, a lot of people think that it just is like it's going to happen. I just got to, man, I just got to get through this pain. And No, you can be free from, from grief. Kia, can I get a witness? You can be set free from grief. It doesn't mean that you don't still um, have moments where you are thinking about, you, th that's fine. We're not telling you to forget anything. But if you're going to move forward, there are some things that you must let go. For some of you, you're going to have to let go of what you thought your life would be. Somebody shout, let go. And there are some things that you, th is, like, you have to be willing to surrender your plan and your idea. Because the Bible says that there is a way that seems right, but the end, but the end of that way leads to death. Oh, y'all put all four up there. Okay. Number two, in order for you to pursue calling, you are going to have to renew your mind. Say renew your mind. That means you are going to have to take every negative thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, usually when we hear somebody say, you got to renew your mind, we've heard it a million times, and most of us have no idea what that means. Let's just be honest, right? Like, the pa pastor will come up here and be like, you got to renew your mind. You'd be like, yes, still have no idea. <laughs> I want to I wanna break it down for you. I want to break it down for you. Can I give you an example? Okay, Shana, can you come up? Kayla, can you come up? I just need two. You got to come up here, yeah. Um, and then Liv, can you come up right here? Okay, you guys are going to be on this side. Let me show you what it means to renew your mind. Olivia today, gracious. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I know, she was taking notes. Um, over, you're going to stand on this side, Liv. Okay? All right, now, this is what it looks like to renew your mind. The Bible says to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. These are negative thoughts. Sorry. I'm sorry. They're cute negative thoughts, right? And this is Christ, all right? Now, when we renew our mind, we take every thought captive. Now, let me show you what this looks like. If God says to me, Erica, I'm calling you to start a business, immediately a thought will come to my mind, there's 20,000 people doing that. You're not going to be successful. That's a negative thought. I take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You going to let me drag you? Okay, I drag that thought to the obedience of Christ. I bring it to him, and when I renew my mind, turn around, spin around, Christ renews that thought, right? And then I take this new thought captive, and now this is my mind. I have the mind of Christ. Now, when we renew something, like Liv didn't give me back my same, Christ. Christ didn't give me back my same thought, because it's like if I'm renewing my license, right? I have to surrender the old one. Like if I'm going to renew my license, they're not going to let me keep. I have to take a new, if, I, if, if I'm going to get a new one, I'm going to have to give you the old one. What happens when we renew our mind, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. He cleans that thought, and now i got a brand new thought. I've got the mind of Christ. Let's say the Lord says, Erica, I'm calling you to, okay, start a business. And immediately the thought comes, um, my friend tried that, and it didn't work for her. It's not going to work for me. I take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I drag that thought to the obedience of Christ. Christ cleans that thought. Spin around. He cleans that thought. Now I take this thought captive, and my mind is renewed. I've got a brand new mind. That's what it looks like. Thank you, ladies. That's what it looks like to renew your mind. So I'm telling you tonight that in order for you to pursue your calling, you're going to have to get brand new thoughts, but not just anybody's thoughts. You're going to have to get God's thoughts about you. Last thing. Meditate. Somebody say meditate. 
if you're going to pursue calling, you're going to have to meditate. Meditate on what? Meditate on the word. Meditate on the word of God. The rhema word that God has spoken over you, you're going to have to meditate on that. Now, meditation is not Buddhist. Like, they didn't create that. That's the word of God. The Bible instructs us that we are to meditate on the word of God. And I'm telling you that if you're going to pursue calling, you're going to. Now, when you think of meditation, some of us think, I taught this lesson at KYA this week. And a young man came up to me afterwards, and he was like, I'm having trouble with meditation because it's just like so hard for me to clear my mind. And I'm like, baby, no. The last thing you want to do is clear your mind. That is not biblical meditation. Biblical med meditation means you fill your mind with the word of God, right? When you meditate, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. That's okay. I'll go back to it. No, let me go to three. In order for you, y'all should have said, excuse me, ma'am, you missed one. <laughs> no. Number three. <laughs> yeah. In order for you to pursue your calling, you're going to have to write it down. Now, I probably skipped this one because it sounds like super practical, right? It's like, ah, uh, write it down. No, this is so important for your calling. You must write it down. Mirsha, the other day, she sent me like 18 voice notes. And I'm like, oh, right? No, it's not 18. <laughs> no, it was all good. She sent me voice notes and... What she was doing, like she sent me something, she was prophesying over me, and everything she was saying was spot on, right? So in her, she reminded me, she was like, hey, a couple Sundays ago, I came to you, and I said, um, I gave you a prophetic word, and I told, and in her, I looked at my phone, in the prophetic word, it says, write the vision, right? And I looked at the word, and I was like, oh, that's so good, never wrote the vision, right? It, it went in one ear, and I, like I received it, but I didn't act on it. But the other day, she called, she sent me voice notes, and she's like, hey, remember I told you you have to write the vision. In the middle of her voice note, I put my phone down, got my pad out, and started writing my vision. Can I tell you why I did that? Because the Bible says in Habakkuk 2.2, write the vision and make it plain upon tablets that they may run that read it. And can I tell you? Most of us aren't running with calling because we have nothing to read. You're going to have to write it down. Now, back to what I was saying about meditation. <laughs> In order for you to pursue calling, you're going to have to meditate. And you don't just meditate on anything. You meditate on the word of God. Meditation is so powerful. S um, studies suggest that true, like when you really meditate properly, somatically, your body doesn't know the difference between your thoughts and your reality. That's how powerful meditation is. And the Bible tells us, now some of this may sound like psychology to you, I promise you it's not. It's Bible. Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now if you're like me, you ask crazy questions like, now how am I going to think in my heart? You ever stop and read something in the scripture and you're like, wait, wait a second, I don't understand. I asked the Lord, what does that mean? When you go back to the original language that the Bible is written in, heart is synonymous with mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The things that you meditate on, when you meditate on the word of God, on the rhema word of God that he's spoken over you, your life will become exactly what you meditate. Some of us, though, can't meditate good because we're too busy trying to manifest. Yeah. Listen, manif manifesting is new age. It's demonic. There's nothing in scripture that tells you that you have the right to manifest. Because what new, age, what new Age writings will say, they'll say, in order for you to manifest, right, you have to think about something. And you think about that thing long enough, and it, be, it shows up in your life. You become the engineer of your own fate. You become the creator of your own reality. That's dangerous. Because you don't create anything. He is the author and the finisher, right? 
And if you got something that, that you manifested, I'm telling you, you need to give it back. Because it ain't from the Lord. So I don't care how many vision boards you got with your, your face next to Michael B. Jordan, it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Because God is not obligated to fulfill your fantasy. He's obligated to fulfill his word. So if I see hashtag manifest under anybody's post, I'm spamming your social media. <laughs> no. But there are some things that we've adopted, y'all, that just aren't from the Lord. And if you're really going to pursue calling, you're going to have to do it his way. You're going to have to do it his way. Standing all over the room. Now, this night has been a night of preparation, and um, there are some of us that will take this word, and it will charge us for the next season, and I pray that that's all of us, but I know that there are women in this room tonight who have some things that they need to get rid of. I know there are. There are some things that you know are holding you back. It could be how you feel about yourself, what you've what you've accepted, the lies of the enemies that of the enemy that you've accepted. And I'm calling it up and out tonight. I said I'm calling it up and out tonight. So if that's you in this room, if if you know there are something, there are things that have been holding me back from the calling that God has placed on my life. Just slip your hands up. I want to know who I'm praying for. Amen. Um, fr freedom is in the room. And there are times when we get to the end of the service like this and we're so focused on getting out of here that you don't realize this is what the whole service was about this one moment right here this is what the whole sermon was about the songs this is what it's all about so if I'm talking to you tonight can you just just come up just come up come on come up we're gonna make a jeans get up here Mirsha y'all come on pastor Missy if you if you will come on because there are some things that's gonna be released tonight and I know this this going to be, it might not be as organized as we want it, but I need us to get our hands on as many women as we possibly can. You guys got to come over here. Because, see, there are some things that are going to get released tonight. No, not next week, not next month. There is a calling on your life that cannot wait. And I don't care if we're touching every woman in this room. I believe by the Spirit of God that if you had the guts to respond to this word, that God is going to perform exactly what you need him to do. So ladies, let's, let's begin to minister. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we surrender. We surrender. We trust your way. We trust your plan. We are no longer going to try to manufacture our own future. We simply say yes. And when there's a yes in the earth, grace shows up. So I thank you for gracing women in this building tonight. I thank you for gracing us for the next season. Ladies, y'all going to have to move quickly because we have a lot of people that we need to minister to. I thank you for gracing the women in this room for the next season. God, it is not by chance that they are in this room tonight. There is something that you've called them to do. And tonight, I believe that there are women who have been turned on tonight. That calling has been activated tonight because they've received the never-changing word of God. The word that does not change. And I believe that tonight, when they act on the word that you've given them, that their lives will move in the direction of their calling. Lord, we're not settling for a life that you didn't call us to. We're not settling for kind of good and just ordinary and regular. God, we want to pursue exactly what you've called us to do. 
we release every, every demonic distraction. In the name of Jesus, we release the distractions that would seem right. We release the distractions that are good, but they're not God. We release those to you tonight, God. And in the name of Jesus, we declare you don't have to look for somebody else. We receive the calling. We receive it by faith tonight. We may not have all of the answers. We may not have all of the steps, but tonight we're walking into it. Because grace will attach itself to a yes in the earth. Somebody shout yes. Somebody shout yes. Somebody shout yes. Now all over this building, raise your hands, lift your voice, and tell the Lord yes. Tell him that I receive the calling on my life. I receive the purpose that you called me to. I receive it, God, and I will not live a life beneath my calling, but I will stretch and I will press for the call and the mark that's on my life that you created before the foundation of the world. Somebody tell God yes tonight. arise tonight. This night was about getting you to see that there's more. There's more. This is not it. This is not the end. This is not as good as it gets. There's more. 
but you have to pursue it. You have to go after it. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for what you've done in this place. And I declare that the enemy will not steal the word from their hearts. But the word, the seed of the word of God will take root in their hearts and spring up and produce fruit. So we thank you, God. We look to you for the steps to take. And we know that you will guide the steps of a righteous man. Come on all over the building. Can you clap your hands and give God praise? Really thank him. Thank him for what he's done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, ladies, we have had a night. We have had a night. And if you're still being ministered to, it's completely fine for you to stay up here. But I want you to know that what God is building with this community is something really special and it's really beautiful and I want you to know that you have a place here. It's not going to be this without you. So I thank you for being here tonight. I thank you for giving up your Friday night to spend time in the presence of God and I'm so excited about what God, the fruit that God is going to produce in your life. Amen? Come on, clap your hands and give God praise. Jesse's coming. Jesse's coming. give him just one more praise. Just one more praise. You know, I was thinking about tonight, may we never take it for granted to gather and worship him when they, there are so many people around the world that can't do this. It's forbidden, especially women. So thank you, Father. I just have a few announcements for us. Our Mother's Day event is coming, woo woo, May 6th, so write that down on your calendars. If you are not connected with us on social media, definitely follow us on Instagram, Kingdom Culture Women FL on Instagram or our Kingdom Culture app. We're going to have tons of updates on there. We have a lot planned for our Vive ministry this year, so get plugged in with us. Um, join a Kingdom group. Grab a sister tonight, somebody that you don't know. Get connected. This is a sisterhood. This is not, I come to church on Sundays and I walk out and I do life alone. We are a sisterhood. So grab someone you don't know tonight and make that connection. We have merch in the lobby. Us ladies, we like our clothes. So check out the merch that we have. Super cute stuff. And last but not least, at Vibe, we love to give gifts. So I have two gifts for two special ladies. The first one is for the first lady that registered. And her name is Bianca Benitez. So Bianca, if you are here, can you raise your hand, Bianca? Awesome, come see me on the corner, Bianca. And then the second gift is for the person who brought the most guests. So if you brought a guest, awesome, but this person really outdid themselves. 14 guests. 14 guests. Jennifer Silva. Woo, Jennifer, awesome. Come see me in the corner, Jennifer. We have a gift for you. Ladies, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm just going to pray us out. Father, we seal this all with your blood. We thank you for the privilege and honor that it's been to be in your presence tonight. Lord, we pray for protection over these ladies as they make their way back home, Lord. Father, we thank you that we are leaving this building, but we are not leaving your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night, ladies. We love you. See you on Sunday.